My name is Klee Benali. I'm originally from Black Mesa on Dinepikea, or what is more widely known as the Navajo Nation. Currently, I reside in occupied Flagstaff, or as we call this area, Kinflane. Can you start by talking a little bit about mutual aid as an indigenous practice and value? For Dine, we have a teaching and principle uh, and understanding of relationality to uh, our cosmos, so to all relations, to spirit, to um, the collectivity of humanity, to non-human beings, to the land, which is articulated as eh. And this is an understanding of our clanship, our kinship, and how we relate to, again, ourselves, in the world, all existence. So this understanding comes with teachings of what the responsibilities of ke are in relation to how we are to be with each other, how we take care of each other, um, how we take care of the land. And that is a way that is guided by other principles. The one that we can articulate the most as far as an indigenous or Dine understanding of mutual aid would be which means in our existence far off um, in old age we live in health and harmony so that's what we strive for is that harmonious existence with all of creation so this has an understanding of what is called mutual aid what has been asserted as mutual aid by you know, anarchists like Kropotkin um, and has widely been used as a term to sort of identify the kind of response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but it's an understanding that has existed as long as we've existed as Dine folks and we have many teachings throughout our existence of when and why maybe people have gone out of that circle of ka and how they could be brought back in. And so this is something that we are charged with the responsibility of constantly tending to with our sacred sites, with um, each other in our families directly or with our greater communities and so forth. But to ask for a definition an indigenous definition of mutual aid is sort of hard because indigenous people aren't a monolith. I think we can study different indigenous people's practices and principles and see commonalities, but that's the kind of anthropological work that I think Kropotkin did, and that's an unnecessary detour. <laughs> but I think we can see those shared um, experiences, teachings, understandings spread throughout anywhere people are still connected to the land and desire to live in that way and have to um, find ways to defend those ways because of colonial violence. The question of what the goals of mutual aid are is a strange question for me to wrap my head around, mainly because Mutual aid is a principle to me, and it's a force, not in and of itself. It's a principle coupled with other principles um, as a way of being. And so, it, in a way, it is a goal, you know, just like saying that, you know, the journey is a destination, is a cliche. Um, uh, but by, I would say, virtue of practicing mutual aid, that is 
you know, where we arrive. I think what mutual aid can offer as a tool in the context of colonial subjugation, um, in the context of a system of globalized capitalism that is destroying our humanity and our relationships to the natural world, um, and mutual aid can be a powerful force that we are um, able to reconnect and maintain those connections to be in right relationship with all of creation. So um, the, the, the goal is when we start with mutual aid to me and then continue to nurture that. It's not an ending point to me. It's not a revolutionary like point, um, but it's a process of liberation. So, and what I mean by uh, mutual aid being coupled with other principles, you know, as anarchists assert, you know, their uh, mutual aid um, is one aspect that is um, how we identify anarchism uh, with direct action, with voluntary association, um, and with mutual aid. I think when we look at those principles together, um, then we understand an articulation of a way of being without having to fuck each other over and competing um, and perpetuating this mythology from European enlightenment of the survival of the fittest with social Darwinism, um, which is just a violent way of understanding the world and destroying um, those beautiful relationships that uh, indigenous people have celebrated and continue to celebrate it, but have faced extreme ruptures under the forces of attack from colonial invasions and occupations. So what is a mutual aid request? Um, there's a lot of ways I guess I could respond to that because it just feels like um, uh, a question without that needs context. Um, so like what's a mutual aid request in, in the time of the pandemic? Um, well, you know, we could look at the, the structures of how most mutual aid uh, groups have formed in response to the pandemic and um, see that there's like request forms and intake processes and responses and all of that and the responsibilities of responding to the need of um, somebody who's vulnerable or specifically articulating certain needs that they have that need to be filled that they can't fill from elsewhere. Um, and they heard this group or project is offering something. Um, uh, a mutual aid request. I, I think when folks say, um, when folks assert that um, we, um, we care for each other, um, there is an implied understanding of the social responsibilities that we have to each other. And so sometimes it gets to the point where we have to ask for help or assistance um, and, or we can just see it and respond and not have to like, we can see that the stress, the harm that's happening, the trauma that's happening in like a crisis point is in itself a request because we can see the failures of the state. We can see the failures of like these charity, nonprofit, um, capitalist organizations that are exploiting crises. crises. Um, and we can be intentional about our response to those um, perhaps not clearly articulated requests with support, with solidarity, um, in a way that, you know, shouldn't be hierarchical if we're talking about the uh, coupling with other principles. Um, that shouldn't be about domination control or exploitation and expecting something in return, um, but giving um, for that uh, understanding and service of the um, principle of taking care of each other, and not trying to fuck each other over to survive. I think it's exceptionally powerful that mutual aid is having a moment because I don't think that those words together 
the intention behind them, the implications can be co-opted out of those intentions. Um, I think at some point people will ask questions of what that actually means and what it should be and see the contrasts of where co-optations are happening and where there is perhaps superficial uh, responses and exploitation of those misuse of those terms because um, it's just the English language and English la language is a language of violence I, I, it's an interesting to be alive in a time and or and organized in a time when anti-fascists had their moment in like sort of mainstream uh, dominant social media uh, and mutual aid has had its moment as well um, so I think like the popularization of the term is, is great propaganda um, and the deeds that are being done are really powerful but lining things up with like an understanding of the deeper um, not just political assertions because this isn't to me uh, a just a political space that we're operating in, but the deeper implications of like our social responsibilities to each other. Like if we're talking about collective liberation, um, then I think bringing mutual aid and grounding it back with it, the understanding of the assertions and those principles is really important. But I think that it's out there, so um, it can only be co-opted so much. I think it's important to reflect and to analyze and critique in real time what we're doing when we talk about mutual aid, especially in response to this crisis. Are we um, basically being an outsourcing of services that the state is happy that they're relieved not to have to provide? Are we replicating the work that charities like churches, violent, you know, um, religious organizations have perpetuated to make dependent um, poor, other marginalized or vulnerable communities. Um, so I think that um, it's important to be critical, uh, but also find ways to support, elevate and build um, without like all the bullshit positivity, <laughs> um, but just recognizing that, um, you know, some skepticism is necessary when there's a lot of profiteering and exploitation that occurs because um, there's a, a lot of nonprofits that have just jumped on the bandwagon and used the term mutual aid uh, and applied it to fucking everything, like just some empty slogan that really doesn't mean anything because they can write grants and use a sexy term that people are passionate about and mobilize uh, volunteers when all their staff are getting paid like high dollars and it's just an exploitative process then. So that shit needs to be called out and that's highly problematic because it's just reinforcing the state, it's reinforcing a system of exploitation, reinforcing capitalism. Um, and uh, that's uh, antithetical to mutual aid. So uh, I think other organizations I think have become very insular and specialized and I think that's also problematic where it's like you know um, and this has been a criticism of info shops in the past like you know if, if you've if you've been around long enough in anarchist spaces <laughs> for the past few decades uh, since younger folks probably wouldn't understand this dynamic but the sort of proliferation of info shops and the interesting strategy of like autonomous zones um, has been highly criticized, but sometimes not criticized enough in relation to like, how far do we go with this? Um, where does it go? Where does it just become this like insular space um, where we're just servicing our own interests? And um, I think that we can be more creative, more um, impactful than that. Um, but it also depends on what our interests and capacities are. Um, but if we're concerned with, uh, at least you know, in the context of indigenous struggles here, where we're being violently uh, occupied by colonial forces, um, then we want to be very specific about what we mean when we talk about mutual aid and how we're organizing, how we're not replicating and reinforcing or uh, benefiting the state with what we're doing. Uh, how we're not replicating 
these missionary groups that have tried to save indigenous people and just made them dependent upon their own uh, ideologies and programs that have just been focused on assimilating us and destroying indigenous peoples and identities in our lands and facilitating further colonial invasions. Um, and the same with corporations and all, all of those who tend to the, the um, violent project of capitalism. So I think it's important to be critical in real time uh, and be clear with our intentions, um, but to also make mistakes, to experiment, uh, to find ways to be humble um, and figure out what works and what doesn't work and not be afraid to fuck up along the way. But, you know, one of the frustrating things I see is like, you know, folks, and, and this is where I think, you know, a lot of folks talk about mutual aid like it's a new thing. And it's ridiculous because if you just read um, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution by Kropotkin, you know, even he acknowledges that he studied bugs. <laughs> he was a bug nerd. He studied indigenous people. You know, he just used it as an assertion against social Darwinism. And um, uh, so, so it's nothing new. Um, this is an old way of being a beautiful, powerful uh, way that um, has many cycles and has continued uh, and has been interrupted um, and faced many violent ruptures. But uh, uh, for me, it's important to um, connect that understanding that it's not new to also this tendency of mutual aid organizations to aid and abet settler colonialism. Um, like, why are we trying to sustain unsustainable ways of being? Why are we concerned about the sustainability of, like, you know, some of these municipalities or populations or different areas where, you know, perhaps the social deteriorations that we're facing are actually the ruptures in the crisis of capitalism? where mutual aid should be an assertion of uh, what people call dual power um, and building these alternative systems in a social um, way that is beyond and outside of or underneath or you know above on top of whatever you want to describe it of this capital dominant social capitalist dominant social order that is still deeply embedded with settler colonial violence but a lot of people want to sustain settler colonialism and be uncritical about it. This is why I also assert that indigenous mutual aid is necessary, even though I sort of um, don't necessarily define indigenous mutual aid, except in the context from a Diné person. I deeply believe that it's important that we don't apply a metrics of quantity of how many like you know warm packs and shit we distributed throughout the winter for unsheltered folks how many like cans of soup you know, for our families that we gave out like you know we're not you know if we're counting the costs and adding shit up it's like who are we trying to prove that we've done x amount of work to to me that's a it's a capitalist logic um the metrics that we should be applying to determine whether or not we're being effective is how deep our relationships are to our communities, however we define that. Um, and I think that that's key. And that goes beyond just human social relations, it goes to the natural environment and to non-human beings as well. How deep are those relationships? How deep can they be if we're operating on stolen lands? You know, do we need to reconcile certain things and be right in right relationship with that first beyond superficial land acknowledgements before we proceed. Um, I think it's important, very important to consider these things when we're talking about mutual aid um, and what our intentions are. So if mutual aid perhaps um, not necessarily had a goal, but just had some kind of additional pr principle built within it um, among many probably other principles, that I think would be a key one is to make sure that we're not just replicating capitalist systems and understanding how we're measuring our eff efficacy, uh, how effective we are, um, but in how deep our relationships and how 
close we are to like perhaps overall objectives of ensuring that mutual aid is making the state irrelevant. <laughs> um, how we don't need those same fucking services from corporations. Like in the, in the crisis that we faced of the beginning stages of the pandemic on Dinevike or the Navajo Nation, we we're the, one of the hardest hit places um, in the so-called US. We had the highest rates of COVID infection per capita that beyond any states. And we have an area, a land-based reservation, so the largest reservation in the so-called US. It's about the size of so-called West Virginia, a population of about 250,000 people. And uh, there's all these statistics that were coming out about, um, you know, 25% of the people who live on our lands don't have access to running water and electricity. We live in a food desert where there's only 13 grocery stores that provide food for that whole population area. Um, and so those are f factors that people were considering. And it was really a harmful narrative to some degree. I mean, it's true, but you know, a lot of our elders are still self-sufficient. How much do we need? How much access to that do we need necessarily? Even though there were certain crisis points because our people, I won't, you know, lie or mislead people and say that we're not dependent on certain aspects of um, colonial food production, but there's a context in history to that because our people face scorched earth campaigns by the federal government to attack our food systems. Before colonization, we never knew what a food desert was. Before colonization, there was no homeless, there was no such thing as homelessness, you know, in these lands. And so all these concepts and all these terms, you know, it, before, before colonization, we didn't know what poverty was. You know, um, we didn't know what the police were. We didn't know what prisons were. Um, and so these terms and these understandings, I think are important context to contextualize um, what we're facing today. If we look at, you know, just certain social factors or economic factors, uh, that's one component, but we I need to tie that and factor that in with the ecological factors. The fact that resource colonialism is why the Navajo Nation government and reservation boundaries were created. Um, how our people have suffered the impacts of extreme poisoning of our land, our air and our water to benefit settler colonial municipalities, their growth um, throughout the so-called state of Arizona and the greater so-called Southwest. Uh, we have to understand that violence is actually still happening to this day where you know, my family comes from in Black Mesa, the area up there, more than 20,000 people have been forcibly relocated due to coal mining operations because of a conquer and divide strategy Im imposed by the U.S. federal government in collusion with a uh, transnational coal corporation and Peabody Coal Company. Um, you know, we look at these consequences that we face with the poisoning of our land, air and water, and we have to factor that in as well. And so part of the solution when people were looking at addressing the crisis of um, this pandemic in our communities uh, in Dinepikea, part of the solution, you know, people were articulating essentially like, well, if we just had Walmarts and Home Depots on every corner, our people would be fine. Um, but that's not a solution because it perpetuates the dependency on those corporations in this capitalist system. Um, you know, we should be articulating um, ways to build infrastructure that are based upon our cultural frameworks that are in line with our traditional teachings and our relationships. And we talk about relationality. I think it's more important to consider, because it, and this is an, an issue I have with activist jargon sometimes, is a lot of folks are interested in intersections of oppression, like intersectionality. Um, but where I grew up, there aren't many roads, there aren't many intersections, but there are a lot of relationships. I'm more concerned with interrelationality and deepening those relationships rather than just intersections of the points where our people's um, lives cross in this existence. So how can we be more intentional and, and heal those relationships and be in a good way rather than just, you know, think about things in those political terms? Um, and, uh, but I mean, somebody will argue that everything's political, but that's because it's been imposed on us by a system of violence. So I, I don't know if that answers your question because it brings up a lot of questions for me too. Um, and ones that I don't think there are easy answers for, just a lot of hard fucking work 
And it's not necessarily just about building stuff up, but it's about also tearing things down, tearing down certain relationships that have been toxic, that still maintain a toxic, toxic relationship that has poisoned the rain. Um, and that's, you know, that has precipitated what is being called the greatest crisis facing humanity right now as global warming or climate change. But for, for our people, so like at least traditional practitioners, the way I was raised, um, what, what the, a lot of the elders have taught me and what they say, their observations are global, global warming is a consequence of the war against Mother Earth and the beings of Mother Earth. It's a consequence of the war that is being waged. And so if we understand things in those terms, it shifts how, what our response and responsibilities are and what ways we could heal um, those relationships. So uh, when it comes down to it, it's a very challenging question, but it's perhaps the most important one that we can tend to. But we have teachings that have been in place. We have teachings that we continue to tend to um, we are surviving through this pandemic um, not because of the state, but in spite of it, not because of corporate, you know, corporations or nonprofit, you know, um, philanthropy and charity, but in spite of it in many ways. Um, and that to me is where we need to tend to and figure out the creative, beautiful ways that we can tear shit down and also build our people up. There's so many ways I can respond to this question about um, the collective capacities of anti-authoritarians right now and what gives me hope, because I, I can talk about hope for a long time. And it's interesting being an older person in these kind of movement spaces, facing these crises. You know, we, we have an interesting trajectory of significant conflicts that have been waged since um, the, the 2000 or you know the early 2000s starting with the Battle of Seattle and the anti-globalization movement you know we can pinpoint a couple of other um, like uh, conflicts um, like Occupy, Standing Rock uh, and the Black Lives Matter struggles um, and now the pandemic sort of like or anti-fascist response to Trump and the um, uh, mutual aid response to the pandemic. And I see um, within that powerful trajectories, I think there are, especially with the double-edged sword of, double-edged dagger really, of social media, the, um, the webs of the networks that we have are more, empowered in some ways than I think they were with indie media, because I think indie media created a massive, important and profound wave of, and way of connecting through um, the interwebs, um, uh, virtually, socially, over great distances that I think was really powerful in spite of like um, repressive, like state repression and so forth. Um, and I think that we're um, in an interesting space um, of experimenting, exploring, and seeing how that works. Um, we can look to, you know, I mean, the, the older struggle of Zapatistas and the way that they were masters of propaganda and using any virtual like, um, uh, medium uh, to connect and broadcast what was happening and rally folks to support in different ways. Um, so I think that there's a powerful trajectory. I, I don't think I'm, you know, arrogant enough to say that I'm an expert in offering like a broad analysis. And I also don't see like, sometimes I also don't feel connected to like a larger movement of anti-authoritarianism, um, except for the understandings of like, ungovernability and how that connects to um, indigenous liberation struggles against colonialism and capitalism, white supremacy, and cis-heteropatriarchy. Um, 
we're smashing a lot of things, fucking a lot of shit up. A lot of people are um, getting locked up, <laughs> though. Uh, state repression is, uh, and the state is finding new and um, it, more extreme ways to repress folks um, or exploit um, aspects of social communications as well. So, yeah, I, um, I feel like there's a lot of ways I could respond to that question, but I'm not one that is gonna, you know, try to paint um, a rosy picture for revolution. I, I don't even like the term revolution. Um, I, you know, I think that for me personally, um, which is strange to talk about such a, a collective problem with a personal response, um, uh, you know, I've heard folks say that, you know, they, they, they regret that they haven't seen revolution in their time, you know, if they pass, um, you know, especially older um, organizers. But I, I've never felt that way um, because I try to experience liberation in every day of <laughs> the way I try to engage in life, in my existence. Um, and there's a lot of, that means I um, face a lot of contradictions. And I think that part of that is getting to a point where you have less contradictions um, and grow the possibilities, even the smallest ones for liberation out um, as meaningfully as possible. And to participate in that, I think is really amazing. I think. I'm not concerned with anarchist movements or anarchist identity, you know. Um, I'm concerned with the principles and understandings and assertions of anarchism, though, and anti-authoritarianism very particularly uh, in times of extraordinary authoritarian repression. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I look to the powerful actions that are deeply inspirational um, from entities like the Conspiracy of the Cells of Fire, like the Earth Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Front, Jane's Revenge, um, people who are striking militantly to destabilize, to disintegrate the social fabrics that uphold the dominant social order um, and who are connected to the history and histories of people who have been in that struggle um, and are continuing and carrying it forward in creative, spontaneous, autonomous ways. Um, sometimes are just tiny little flare-ups and voices in the dark smashing a panel of glass or sometimes in cathartic mass actions where shit's getting burnt down, the cop cars are getting flipped, set on fire, or border patrol vehicles are being destroyed. Um, sometimes I feel like that's all happening all at once in a beautiful continuum, and it's amazing to appreciate, but then, you know, it's not something that's just easy to just celebrate and sit back and clap about, because it's, uh, a challenge with the risks and consequences that we face in the context of growing state repression, um, authoritarianism particularly, and uh, authoritarian nationalism, or what people call fascism in those terms as well. But yeah, sorry, I, I mean, I think this, my response for this is more of a conversation, you know, I think, because it's like, like, what do you see? You're traveling, doing this documentary, um, engaging with all these projects. So I think, you know, for some of us doing mutual aid work on a local, you know, uh, local level, like our, literally our bleach soaked hands have been like, you know, we've been staring at them and we've been, you know, fucking moving like shit that was either liberated or, you know, from Walmart or stolen from or, or donated or whatever from other places 
and just processing and taping boxes and getting things out to people who are most vulnerable. So sometimes we only see what's in front of us when we're in the midst of that. And it's hard to appreciate really what's happening in the larger context. So perhaps you all, and especially after you finish with this projects, might, might have a, a better response to that question than I could offer. Um, what I would like to see, or what you could call hope, um, is more of that. Um, that it's cultivated, that those fires that have been lit aren't extinguished, that we find ways to support those who are in cages, that we support those who feel like their voices have been stripped away and silenced, that we support those who have been constantly trying to bang their heads and tear down fucking walls, um, that we support those who are ripping up the fences, that we continue to, you know, be those when we can uh, on the front lines to risk wherever they may be, um, or be the forces that make sure that they're fed <laughs> and they have like all the PPE and all the shit that they need. <laughs> Because that kind of shit, dirty, gritty work of just washing the fucking dishes, mopping the floors, um, you know, constantly cleaning shit and taking care of like the basic shit people really don't think of, like the trash, you know, all that basic little shit is fucking radical and beautiful and fucking <laughs> amazing as fuck. Um, yeah, but uh, I think. Um, the quote from Joan Baez that always sticks with me when people ask me about hope is, you know, I, I, I don't, it's not that I don't believe in hope because I do believe in despair because I see it, I've lived through it, I've survived through it. It's that I don't believe in sitting on my hands, voting and expecting politicians to do something for me. And that's why I've been drawn to anarchism is because of that aspect of direct action and um, un unmediated responses for our desires um, in this world to actualize them, to materialize them. And which, you know, for Diné people, we say Taho uh, Ajit Ego, which is basically, you know, if it's going to be, it's going to be up to you. If it's going to be, if something's going to happen, it's going to be up to you, um, which is <laughs> very much an assertion of direct action. And so Joan Baez's quote is, action is the antidote to despair. Um, and so for me, that's the biggest element of it. It's just moving forward and looking at those smallest possibilities and making them grow. I like also to define when people ask like for definitions of radicalism, like I put every, you know, like the basic um, reform versus revolt argument forward. But I also like to add that it's the politics of possibility. If I were to have a politics, it would be a, more of a politics of possibility. Pol possibility against despair in the face of extraordinary suffering and trauma. And that's the politics of healing. I don't know if that answers your question. That was a big ramble. That, that was a big fucking tangent in ramble. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say things that I repeat because I think they bear repeating. Um, so uh, mutual aid, when we consider it, for me is certainly about the radical redistribution of material goods. But I think from an indigenous perspective, as we've gone through this pandemic and you know, we've reached out through a network that I helped to establish called Indigenous Mutual Aid, um, which is a sort of like informal network of different mutual aid projects that popped up in response to the pandemic that explicitly were anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist, and some of them just like really autonomous, like even individuals um, or collective, non-hierarchical of, of course, and, um, and anti-colonial specifically with coming at it from an anti-colonial um, position um, but our assertion that we would add on is that um, mutual aid is a radical redistribution of resources and material resources and power. Um, and it is in relation to uh, the spiritual power that we have to tend to um, and consider as indigenous people in these lands. 
um, and everything that comes along with that. Um, we can assert an indigenous mutual aid, we can assert indigenous rooted direct action, we can assert indigenous principles that completely are reconcilable if we calculate them through the principles of anarchism, which is why I'm an indigenous anarchist. And if I'm pressed, I really say I'm a Dine anarchist because I'm more informed by my cultural context and I can't speak for other indigenous contexts because of, you know, we're not a monolith and so forth. But we have certain shared experiences and teachings that we can at least broadly speak to on some levels. And a lot of that comes back to the idea of relationality and with all existence, our cosmology and what responsibilities we have to that. Um, I think in terms of mutual aid also when we consider it is important to I think not just separate as like a, a practice that you know, becomes specialized and just as a service. Like I think mutual aid is also mutual defense. Um, you know, we're um, doing mutual aid and providing like fucking goods and materials or whatever in the context of the pandemic for those most vulnerable in our communities or those who are in need. Um, and then we're anti-fascist by night or maybe at the same time. <laughs> like. Um, you know, it's not uh, like we flip a switch and mutual aid turns off. It's something that, you know, we come to embody. And I think that's why it's important to consider it more as a principle rather than just um, a specific tactic or specific action that we do. And that's why activism, you know, and activists tend to make me want to throw up because they want to like professionalize things and, you know, organize things on with colonial logic or capitalist logic, you know, uh, approaches. And that shit doesn't work. You know, we know where it leads and it leads to the commodification of those to turn them into services or missions to help those who are less fortunate, um, which is what we completely reject, especially in the context of resisting colonial violence um, in these lands. And we don't fucking need that anymore. Um, so mutual aid absolutely is a threat. And I think like, it's part of why I say mutual aid can only be co-opted so much. It really can't be co-opted fully because it, in, in, implicitly it is a threat to those power structures that cannot, that are not compatible with the relationships that are necessary to be in right resist, existence with all of creation. Um, and that to me is really if we can embody that, then we are practicing liberation. You know, it, I, I said that I don't really believe in revolution because, you know, in the context of, you know, indigenous struggles here in the so-called US, revolution would imply that there's an overthrow of one power to impose another one. I just, I'm an abolitionist. I want to see the system be composted. And um, from those ashes, from the compost, that we can grow in good, right relationship with each other um, to move forward to better ways of being for all existence. Um, and we're facing that crisis right now. We can see that colonialism has been the crisis for our people, that capitalism has been the virus for our people, and that you know if we are to tr truly heal uh, through this crisis of crises, compounded crises, again, you know, in our communities and Denepike on the reservation, we have faced these crises. We faced, this isn't the first virus that we faced. Um, the colonial invaders brought their viruses before, but our people had our medicines. So yeah, I, I think that we can be concerned with all these terms. We can be concerned with all these labels and categories, um, but it comes down to what we're actually doing with each other. Um, and that also means a fight. We're not all gonna fucking get along. I don't believe in unity. I don't believe in leftist unity, especially. <laughs> um, uh, there are many spaces that are, should be contested. Um, there are many conflicts that are essential. If we're gonna talk about accountability, if we're gonna talk about anything, 
in terms of transformative and restorative justice, if we're going to talk about anything in terms of healing, um, then there, a lot of that also is going to look like conflict. It's going to be a fight. Um, and that's why this space, the Tullahoan Info Shop that we're sitting in, where Confunded Mutual Aid is housed, is a, a space of conflict infrastructure. It's a direct action resource center, so we can have access to the resources that we need or the space to mobilize to continue those fights. Because um, that's one of the hardest things to do is to try to organize and hold space, especially for Indigenous people. We're um, alienated from our own lands. <laughs> And we have superficial pol or politicians superficially declaring their land acknowledgements on top of that while they're violating and exploiting <laughs> our ways of being. So, yeah, I, I could talk endlessly about that. And I think those are points that I've said before and I think continue to bear repeating. Um, the stakes are really fucking high and we need as many people to fucking help to fight back like so many people are concerned with returns to normalcy it's like i want to see this shit fucking burn down so we can build and grow and move forward for a healthy existence um and the last thing i, I think um that i would offer to you and this might be helpful for other folks based on our experiences organizing especially long term because we've been doing um what is considered mutual aid work out of this info shop for close to two decades now um, and I've been doing it longer like arguably um, in this community and around this area for much longer um, and uh, I would offer that like it's okay to have your mutual aid projects uh, fail um, but if we don't learn from those failures we don't like critically analyze and build and grow um, then that fucking sucks. But recognize that we don't need to institutionalize everything. I think that's a real, really a sort of capitalist and colonial logic um, that we live in cycles um, as human beings outside of settler time. Um, you know, these, this sort of like a, um, trajectory of settler existence has always been on a timeline that is seeking to meet its own end. Uh, and it looks to fulfill itself through that, you know, annihilation, if you look at it from a Christian perspective or apocalypse. Um, we've survived what could be considered the apocalyptic <laughs> indigenous people here. So we have lessons uh, to share, you know, teachings and understandings, even in our own ancestral histories of coming into these worlds or going through different worlds of what problems we've suffered through and what we have uh, what teachings, ceremonial understandings, which uh, practices and medicines um, help guide us to be in good relationship. And so uh, for me, I think it's important to um, break that perpetuation of settler time and reconnect to ways of being in cycle with each other. Um, and that's part of that interrelationality it doesn't exist on a timeline that has a beginning, middle, and end. That is just sort of like a one-way track of, you know, a capitalist life uh, and death cycle. Um, but one that is a cycle of um, right relationship with our ancestors. And if we go out of that circle, we brought it back into that circle and the cycle. But sometimes projects need to be composted because from that compost and those ashes, good things can grow. Um, so even with our own like projects, we don't perhaps shouldn't be considered with just institutionalizing and building something that looks like a nonprofit with a fucking big sign and branding fucking everything with like stickers on all the mutual aid packages and leaflets and all that shit. If it looks messy, maybe that's fucking good. That's the language of the streets, maybe language of our people it makes it feel accessible. Um, and breaks down like those um, projected aspects of the dominant social order and their spectacle. So be messy, experiment, don't be afraid to fuck up as long as you're not fucking other people over. Be humble, learn some good lessons, and think of things cyclically, not just about building institutions. Perhaps that could be something that helps us get a little farther and be better with each other.